Uh, just, just for a few minutes before I ask Vicky to present the report, I'd just like to ask uh, Mr Long. He has uh, a difference with some of the things that were said this morning. Mr Long, I'll allocate you three minutes if you would like to say what your point is. And then I will ask Amy Sesper to reply. Can I start again? I apologise. Is this okay? I thank the Chairman for the opportunity to respond in three minutes to some of the issues which were raised by Amy Sesper. The first point I want to make is that much of what we heard was to do with the commercial uh, nature of the application, not to do with planning. And as the Chairman rightly pointed out at the beginning of the proceedings, this is a planning committee meeting, not one considering commercial issues. Yeah. Secondly, in terms of um, the uh, much we heard about uh, discussion about the heat, I want to be absolutely clear that the planning officers make clear that in the absence of contracts to dispose of heat, that cannot be considered as a relevant or material, given material weight in the determination of this application. That is important. Heat demand is not there now and will not be there at any time in the future. There's discussion about local communities benefiting from it. There are no local communities that will benefit from that heat. Thirdly, there was discussion about the community liaison involvement. And many over here were extremely unhappy about the comments which were made about community liaison. There was a community liaison group which was set up. That community liaison group disbanded and they said in a letter signed by the majority of the people on that group, we therefore wish to be disassociated with any favourable comments or submissions relating to the community liaison group which Amy Sesper may use in support of their impending planning application. The communities represented here and those around are not of the view which was expressed by Amy Sesper. We have felt marginalised, not involved in the process, and we, we did deeply object to being represented in an incorrect manner. Finally, I'd like to say that we concentrated our views on planning policies. What we heard from the applicant was almost nothing about how those planning policies, the objections which we raised, would be overcome. We talked about the mitigation which is required to offset the harm. There was comments about the plan for mitigation, but the plan for mitigation does not ensure delivery of that, of, of that mitigation. And without delivery of that mitigation, harm will be long-standing and permanent. Mr Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to respond to those four points. Thank you for being brief. Uh, would a representative or, or representatives of Amy Sesper like to respond to that? And then I will ask Vicky if she'd like to add anything. <laughs> Mr Chairman, obviously this is the first we've heard of those points. I, I apologise. Uh, Mr Chairman, obviously this is the, her, the first that we've heard of these points. Um, they involve a, a number of, of responses and I was wondering if we could just take a couple of minutes just to get our responses together. Okay, as I say, we'll just literally take a couple of minutes just to make sure. Five minutes? Five minutes. I apologise, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I appreciate the time you've given us. Uh, obviously, we were unaware that there was likely to be uh, a debate. We were ready to answer questions directly. Um, I will ask uh, David Adams to talk about the, the planning policies. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. I'll make this very, very brief. Um, I'd like to deal with points one and four, the first one being financial considerations, point four being with respect to planning policy. Um, with respect to the financial considerations that were mentioned, um, I would like you to, I'd like to refer you to paragraph 7.575 of the officer's report, a report which has been considered by legal as being legally sound, and it states the PFI grant from DEFRA to the County Council if the facility built would constitute a local finance consideration for the purposes of, the, of amended section 70 of the Town and Country Planning Act. So far as local finance consider, considerations are material, they are relevant to a planning decision. 
With respect to the fourth point, which was with regard to uh, planning policy, um, again, I'd like, you to refer, I'd like to refer you to uh, the report of the officers, particularly in respect of the conclusions at 8.2 and then 8.4. Um, 8.4, quite rightly, states that it may not be necessary for a proposal to comply with all the policies of the development plan in order to be found compliant with the development plan. The officer then sets out at 8.4, as discussed in section 7 of the report, it's concluded that the proposals receive support or do not conflict with some policies in the development plan. In respect of support, it lists renewable low carbon energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, moving waste up the hierarchy, achieving effective waste management um, and waste management targets, provision of waste management facilities, supply of secondary and recycled aggregate, locational criteria facilities, recycling, sorting and transfer of waste. It's considered that the development would not conflict with policies in respect, of, um, uh, in respect of harm being caused to residential amenity, including air quality, pollution, impact on health, noise, dust, odour and litter. She then goes on to state that there will be, um, in, in the officer's view, a limited degree of conflict with some locational policies and with respect to, um, to landscape, the principal policies that the objectors have identified as being contrary to re relate to the Harrogate, Harrogate plan, which quite rightly does form part of the development plan, but is not designed to deal with waste management facilities because it is not a local authority function. Thank you. I'd like to just now hand you to John. Very brief. Thank you. Um, so. Um, the points that Mr Long made about uh, community liaison, um, I didn't say, didn't even indicate that there was any support <coughs> for the proposals amongst the group. Um, I described it as free and unfettered access. Uh, the debate was, uh, and the discussion was um, very frank and thorough. Um, and there was total transparency, meeting notes are there for all to see, and the feedback that was provided by participants is there for all to see. So there's no um, there's no intent to, to demonstrate support for the proposals, just that there's been a very a thorough process of uh, community engagement. Apologies. Uh, Mr Chairman, no, I have no comments with relation to those two speeches. Okay, right, well, now we'll want to... It's a normal practice to presume that members have read the report, so Vicky will not go through it page by page. She will pick out the relevant issues that we need to debate. Uh, I, I will ask members not to interrupt during Vicky's presentation. There will be natural breaks at the end of each section when you will be invited to ask questions. If we, if we have uh, interruptions, we could be here till midnight. So could you just hold your questions until we get to a question session and then we'll, we'll have seven, three or four breaks during the presentation. So Vicky, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Um, as in applications, um, a PowerPoint presentation has been prepared for members to view photographs of the site. This is recognising that members have also undertaken a site visit last week. I undertook to ensure that the photographs shown on that site visit were also part of, that present, uh, part of this presentation. So if members bear with me, I'll remind members of those photographs too. Um, I have a number of reports that have been published since the substantive report. I'll do that after the, the presentation, if members are okay with that. Um, apologies if the light pen um, strikes anybody's eyes. I'll use the laser pen as, uh, as little as possible, but I do need to point out matters on the slides in front of you uh, this afternoon. The presentation in front of you starts with the first slide, which shows the application... Um, which you will have in your packs, members. Um, um, a pack of A3 plans, uh, colour plans, have been produced for members. So if members would have those to hand, um, and they can refer to them in detail. Um, I haven't replicated all of the plans within the plan pack, as there are a number of elevational details, uh, which are best seen at A3 size in front of you on, uh, on paper. Okay. 
Okay, members. Um, the slide in front of you shows the uh, application area at its fullest extent. The application area includes the um, routes proposed for cable connection to the national grid, and those are the lines shown here up to Arkendale Village um, and along the main road uh, down to Coneythorpe. The substation is in this location here. There are plans within your plan pack that show the substation in, in greater detail. What is referred to by the applicant as the core application area is the, ap is the area here. So this, this plan um, provides the a general orientation of the application site in, its, in the context of the surrounding villages. The principal road network is principally the um, north uh, south alignment of the A1 motorway and aside that the A168 uh, which is a, a road running on the east side of the A1M. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, the route, there are two routes proposed as part of this application. Route A is proposed to follow a road uh, to, a, to the point here at the, the very top, the very apex of this slide. It then diverts onto a public bridleway along the lane and then down onto the public highway, again down to the uh, substation here in this location, just north of Coneythorpe Village. Route B, again, would take um, the route um, underneath the A1 motorway, a cable route that would be in culvert um, along the line of the highway verge and to the substation here. There are two routes proposed. Um, it isn't known at this stage whether the uh, operator, uh, which route would be chosen by that operator, and therefore both routes have been included within the planning application in front of you uh, this afternoon. An aerial photograph uh, in front of you shows the application site at its fullest extent, with the core application here where the light is, um, and the roads showing the alignment of the cable routes to Coneythorpe and Arkendale Village. The aerial photograph uh, will show the woodland areas which are referred to within the report. Uh, the closest to the application site being Shepherd's Wood. There's also Bog Plantation and a number of woods called Lylands Wood uh, in where the light is, uh, Broadfield Wood and the registered park and garden which lies to the south of the application site. To the southwest, there are further woodland areas uh, on the Flaxby Golf Course site and south of the A59, further south. The slide in front of you um, has uh, taken the um, core application area um, plan which formed part of the planning application details. For the purpose of getting the clarity on the presentation, new labels have been put, put onto the slide, but it is using the applicant's base um, aerial photograph. I'm using this slide because it gives members um, the best overview of the application site itself. The A1M, as you'll remember, uh, runs along here where the light is, um, in the north-south direction, but alongside to the east of the application area, the A168. I shall point out other, other places that uh, members also visited on the site visit last week. Uh, the site entrance itself into the site, the existing site entrance to both the uh, operational landfill site and the remaining uh, operational elements of the former uh, sand and gravel quarry. Clearo House is proposed as the visitor and education and officers uh, development uh, where the light pen is. Again, the core application area is this application, is this, is this area delineated by the existing hall roads on the site. Members will recall um, going to the top of Sand Hill, uh, to the top of the picture here, Sand Hill is uh, one of the highest areas in the application site and indeed in the, the vicinity. The proposal is to raise that uh, area of land as part of these uh, application details, uh, which raises that um, level of the land from 76 metres 
above ordnance datum to 82 metres above ordnance datum. So a six metre lift on that uh, particular uh, area of land. The um, further to the, in the distance uh, is the uh, registered park and garden uh, in the area just where I'm pointing the light pen here um, and the uh, woodlands within that registered park and garden. The uh, area in the middle is the existing landfill site, the operational area of the landfill site and you will recall on the actual site visit itself seeing the pipework of the landfill gas, uh, ex the active landfill gas extraction system uh, which is generating electricity from the existing landfill. Uh, further to the left of the picture is Shepherd's Wood, um, which over the um, uh, years has, um, um, a num has been affected by a number of uh, permissions by the landfill uh, development, but it still retains ancient woodland status. To the south of the picture, you'll see that the attenuation <coughs> pond here, which is proposed as the attenuation pond for the proposed development of the AWRP site it has been previously used by the uh, existing quarry operator and would indeed continue to be in use um, in this particular application. The farm to the, um, uh, the road here, the access road, um, is South Farm, which is the closest residential uh, property to the application site but also a working farm. Members, um, having your plan pack um, details of the application um, that have been uh, put forward by the architects, the architects' drawings showing the elevational details um, of the buildings. If I may refer members to page 361 of your plan pack, um, you should see the elevational details of the energy from waste plant. Have I got the right page? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have members been able to find that yeah. elevation? Okay. Um, members. The reason why I've, um, I've pointed members to that particular elevation or detail is to alert members to the, the changes in, um, in floor level and topography, and it will help with the understanding of this particular development. If, I'm, if I run through the uh, development as, as um, a proposed waste input into the site, as a waste um, Refuse collection vehicle would enter the site. I'll take, it, take you through from start to finish. The vehicles would enter over the, um, en the way bridge and site office here, where the vehicles would enter that would be weighed uh, and assessed for acceptability into the proposed development. The um, waste vehicle would then uh, take the journey up an access ramp into what's called the tipping hall. The tipping hall is the furthest south uh, element of the building complex. The tipping hall would stand at, um, the roof of the tipping hall would be 14.7 metres in height. The finished floor level in the tipping hall is higher, five metres higher than the finished floor level of the rest of the buildings. The reason being is that, me, is that uh, refuse collection vehicles would, uh, dis, would um, um, discharge their, the content of their waste and there will be bunkers that are uh, at a lower level, some seven metres lower. So the distance from the, the floor of the bunkers to the floor of the tipping hall is in fact 12 metres. And members should be able to uh, see that on the right hand side at the elevational details of the um, energy from waste plant. If members need me to explain that further, is that, is that okay? Okay, um, another element of the tipping hall is that it would extend um, for, a width, uh, for a length of 92.9 metres along the very uh, edge. I have elevational details of the artist's drawings as well to show you. The tipping hall is the only part of the development that would have a, a green roof 
Um, that would be planted up with sedum, a plant species, um, the, and that would be the only building with a sedum roof on the part of the development. Okay, taking the, the journey through of waste within the development, the waste would be taken to the me mechanical treatment facility and members will have in their plan pack the internal layout of the mechanical treatment facility. The mechanical treatment building would be at a height of 19.8 metres. It would have a stretch a distance of 103.4 metres um, running in a north-south axis uh, for the entire length of the um, core application area. Sorry, for halfway in the, in the length of the application area, sorry. The um, material uh, would then, once it's been sorted, uh, if there are uh, recyclates that are in, extracted from the development, they would be stored outside in um, Portico building, um, outside of the mechanical treatment facility, along its length here where the light pen is. And that would be the storage area for recyclates that are recovered from the waste stream. I should point out in the, um, in the particular aspect of the mechanical treatment facility, you'll see where the light pen is here. There is a, a stack within the roof of the, um, the building which would reach a height of 28 metres. That is for extraction. It is not a flare stack, uh, a flue stack, sorry, which is the main in energy from waste plant building here. So moving on through from the mechanical treatment facility, waste would then enter the energy from waste building um, and it would be um, burnt in the burners and the elevational details for the energy from waste plant do show that. Um, it would then heat the boiler and the steam from the, the boiler would then drive the turbines also within that building. The energy from waste building is proposed to be 36.4 metres in height. Alongside the, um, the buildings, you'll see here in the centre the anaerobic digester, which is to take biodegradable waste, food waste, um, that would be stored in this silo um, and processed. That silo would be 32 metres in height and would be 15.7 metres in width. The biogas, which has previously been uh, referred to, and in the report it is explained that the biogas would be stored uh, with a, a capacity of some 430 square meter, cubic metres of, um, of, uh, in the biogas holder. The gas would then be burnt within the gas engines, which are located just to the north of the mechanical treatment facility. Moving further north on the, the, um, the artist's sketch here of the, uh, air cool, uh, the uh, development, there are air cool condensers. There are six air cool condensers proposed on the side. These would be elevated uh, by 12 metres and they would reach a maximum height of 24 metres. Moving to the final element uh, of this particular part of the complex of the energy from waste facility is the incinerator bottom ash facility. This facility, the processing facility, would take the incinerator bottom ash and would produce a secondary aggregate for use in, in numerous construction projects. The, um, air, the part of the building here um, is a storage facility which adjoins that, which is at a lesser height. Um, it's some 12 metres, 12.3 uh, metres in height, and the IBA processing facility is 14.8 metres in height. If members recall my mentioning on the, the pre, one of the previous slides that Sand Hill would be elevated in, uh, in uh, height by some six metres, taking it to 82 metres uh, in height, it, is, um, it should be pointed out that this will not mask from the south uh, the entirety of the views of the building complex. The EFW facility would stand some 13.4 metres higher than the top of Sand Hill. Moving to the next slides, um, I, I said to members that I would show uh, elevational details um, and these have been produced, reproduced on the uh, boards outside of the room uh, today 
uh, for members of the public and all of, these, all of the information has been available to view on the public website. The, I have focused in on uh, these particular um, parts of the application details to ensure that the, it is legible on this slide. However, there are landscape detailing, uh, sorry, there is landscape detailing lying either side of the proposal, um, but you will be able to see those in the, mem in the members' plan pack in front of you today. So this shows the west elevation. It does not show any of the uh, embankments or landscaping that would lie to the west. It is showing a cut-through section drawing of the uh, proposed building. You'll see the tipping hall with uh, uh, the one that I showed you as a, um, a sedum roof. Um, the energy from waste building. You cannot see the uh, mechanical treatment building from this particular angle. The energy from uh, waste flue stack. Apologies, I should have mentioned the height of the flue stack. That's 70 metres in height. The air-cooled condensers, anaerobic digester and the uh, um, incinerator bottom ash facility. From the east, so this is looking from the landfill site uh, side of the uh, proposed development. Um, again, the elements that you can see from this particular um, orientation, uh, the, um, the elevated level of the tipping hall. Um, members will recall my mentioning of the storage areas for the recyclers that are taken from the waste stream that would be stored here. This shows the extent of the, the length of the mechanical treatment facility, and members will have the internal layout of that facility in, in your pack. The energy from waste facility, the flue stack, air cool condensers, and this time the uh, biogas holder of the anaerobic digester can be seen in this particular uh, view. From the south of the development, um, you'll see the extent of the uh, sedum roof, shown here. Uh, apologies, members, it doesn't show up as, 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 uh, as such a green as it, uh, it quite could be, um, but it does show that the, um, that is um, a sedum roof on the top of the tipping hall. Uh, behind that, the mechanical treatment uh, building. Just above that, you'll see the height. I mentioned it was 32 metres in height, the anaerobic digester. <coughs> the energy from waste facility itself and the flue stack and the processing facility just in the corner here, uh, protruding behind the energy from waste building. From the north, um, this is um, a cut through. It doesn't show as if you were actually uh, seeing the development because you will note that the, wel sorry, the welfare building is not in this particular uh, section drawing. But it does show the uh, main complex of the energy from waste facility from the north. Moving on to the uh, uh, other uh, element of the proposal is the, um, the refurbishment, conversion and extension of the existing farmhouse known as Claro House. My apologies, the writing at the bottom is not coming, coming up very well, but it, it is the Claro House... Uh, this is the, where the light pen here is looking at the original farmhouse building. And members will recall um, a walk around from the, um, the entrance, uh, the, gate, the gated entrance to Claro House and walking around the whole of this proposed uh, building. The, um, the visitor centre itself would comprise this L shape here, which would take up the existing garage uh, complex and also the existing single story uh, outbuilding which formerly housed the stables for the farm. Within the courtyard area would be the open space for visitors and indeed for um, staff uh, in, within the office, offices of this particular development uh, outdoor exhibition space. You'll see there's a number of um, additions to the building uh, using a combination of blue engineering brick and, and red brick and timber cladding. Um, and these would replace uh, some of the lean-tos that are already existing. I do have photographs of the existing building uh, to refresh memories on, uh, from last week's site visit. Um, the materials used uh, are principally um, the uh, matching red brick 
and blue engineering brick plus uh, timber cladding. Members, uh, the next slide shows the uh, proposals for landscaping uh, from in, in terms of what would be planted uh, at the operational phase, the, the, the commencement of development phase uh, of this particular development. There's a number of specimen uh, trees, areas of tree, uh, areas of specimen trees, <laughs> rather, um, proposed uh, in, near the amenity block, uh, which is here, the tree and shrub planting and grass and wildflower mix, um, together with the um, reconfigured sand hill. Um, the highest point of sand hill would shift slightly uh, to the east and would be seen as a, as a higher point of land uh, within the landscape. There is proposed uh, woodland planting on here and parkland trees uh, to, to try and um, mirror the uh, parkland trees of the registered park and garden. There's also the attenuation pond here is proposed for marginal aquatic planting um, and the uh, purpose here is to improve on the biodiversity value of that particular pond. I haven't included all of the um, particular scenarios for restoration for the particular uh, site as there are a number of scenarios that are involved in this particular development. It is explained in the report that um, if the adjoining landfill site were to implement a, landf a leachate treatment facility and coppice planting, then the, tr then the landscaping would be different to that which would eventually uh, be seen on site. So I'm using this as an example of proposed site restoration post decommissioning of the development. I have a number of photographs of the actual site uh, taken on the site um, to uh, show the application site, but I've also got the viewpoints uh, that were shown at each of the, the uh, stops during the site visit too. This particular uh, view is the entrance, the existing entrance to the quarry and the uh, landfill site um, where the vehicles, existing vehicles and members will have experienced the uh, refuse collection vehicles and the yellow vehicles coming into and out of the site whilst we were on the site visit. The uh, photograph in front of you on this slide shows the proposed entrance uh, to the site. Um, in fact, you'll see the tracking out of vehicles on the road. The um, A168 uh, runs along here where the light pen is. Where the photograph is taken from is the entrance to the uh, Claro House development and the proposed visitor centre and education centre. It should be noted that this is also the entrance to properties that are along Walls Close uh, House um, and a number of conversions of properties that are along that road. Uh, members will recall um, going to the top of Sand Hill and this shows the, a photograph, albeit um, admittedly it was in, in better weather than the uh, site visit. Um, this photograph shows the entire core application area and shows the flat land left from the previous uh, mineral storage area, mineral processing area. Um, previous photographs that are available within the application details will have shown the starfish shape of the uh, mineral processing plant and conveyors previously on this site. Along the uh, left-hand side of the photograph here, uh, members will see the uh, planting and the existing hall road up to the, the um, landfill site and where we took the, the journey up to the top of Sand Hill. Um, this is part of, and is explained in the report, that this was uh, part of the screening of the mineral and landfill site permissions that have been granted over the past 20 or 30 years. To the right-hand side of the photograph shows the, uh, the completed and restored landfill site. Um, you can't make out the uh, pipe work on that site, um, but closer inspection 
uh, would reveal the landfill gas um, management system op in operation on that side. The photograph in front of you shows the view looking east over the jointly between the existing uh, restored site and indeed the pipework on the uh, site and the existing landfill site operated by FCC Environmental. This photograph shows the view looking south, again taken from the top of Sand Hill. Um, in the distance, I will point out for members um, the Temple of Victory, which is where the red light is here, so that members are able to orientate themselves as from the site visit uh, which took place last week. I have a number of photographs um, for um, uh, the Claro House development. This shows the existing, sorry, the existing road uh, and gated access proposed to be um, uh, metalled and, um, and allow traffic, visitor traffic and uh, staff traffic uh, into the proposed visitor and staff uh, offices. The slide, if members recall, when I was uh, looking at the sketch of uh, Claro House, it showed the uh, former stables building, single-storey building, which is proposed uh, to be uh, refurbished and converted and extended to provide the visitor centre itself. Um, may I draw members' attention to the timber barn here? Um, that is proposed to be demolished and will not uh, remain on the particular development this, uh, this uh, gated access here is proposed for the access for buses, uh, sorry, coaches and minibuses to gain access to the centre itself. They would be separate from uh, access by car. Uh, a view showing, uh, looking due northeast across the uh, outbuildings, the proposal is to retain as far as possible um, the uh, existing fabric of the buildings and to reopen the uh, former um, fenestration on, on the building uh, and doorway as part of the, the visitor centre. This shows the, uh, the, the Clara House uh, farmhouse, which has only recently <coughs> been vacated uh, by the occupiers. I understand that the occupants of Clara House have moved into an, a, a converted property uh, on, elsewhere on the estate. This gable end elevation shows the part of Claro House, the residential part of Claro House, that is proposed to be converted to offices uh, for the development. Members will recall that there is proposed to be a, a walkway from the uh, visitor centre to avoid conflict of pedestrians visiting the uh, proposed complex from the operational traffic to the energy from waste facility. This shows the central courtyard where I was uh, referring to uh, the uh, outdoor space um, proposed to be refurbished and to provide outdoor space for the, both visitor centre and for the officers. Members will recall uh, my mentioning on the site visit that there were a number of viewpoints that had been assessed as part of the environmental statement and the landscape and visual impact assessment. The viewpoint location shown on this slide show the five kilometre radius study area for the viewpoints. The viewpoints, I understand, were agreed with the landscape architects of both the County Council and the Borough Council. The, the viewpoints shown on this slide are assessed as either experiencing moderate, moderate to large or large adverse effect. There is one single viewpoint that is assessed as having large adverse effect, and that is viewpoint 11. Viewpoint 10, the quarry access, is initially in year one uh, assessed as having moderate to large um, effect, and that viewpoint would reduce to slight um, effect uh, in year 15. Um, that takes into account the landscaping that is proposed as part of the development. 
A number of uh, slides that will follow show the viewpoints that members were taken to uh, on the site visit. I do have to point out one particular viewpoint that mem uh, sorry, two particular viewpoints on this particular slide that members weren't taken to for practical reasons being um, access onto um, public footpaths by quite a distance, which would have extended the time period of the site visit. Those viewpoints are viewpoint two, Nairsborough Round, and viewpoint 25, Sleeper Farm. The viewpoints, however, have been um, photographed by the County Planning Authority and have also, um, in order to verify the applicant's photographs. So the slides that I will show you uh, this afternoon do include those viewpoints that were as assessed within the uh, environmental assessment of the landscape and visual impact assessment. However, we weren't unfortunately able to see this particular viewpoint. I've shown here on this slide the verification photograph of the planning authority taken in September of this year against the uh, photo montage of the uh, developer. The photo montage shows the development, the um, energy from waste development proposal in the centre of the photograph. Sorry for this wobbly red light, but it's in the centre of the photograph here. Viewpoint um, number three at Arkendale. This viewpoint, um, again, has been verified by the County Planning Authority taking a photograph in the same location as that provided by the applicant. The applicant's photo montage shows the... the, the um, development here in this location here. I'll take the light off so you can see that. This uh, replicates the photo montage that members were shown um, also at the uh, site visit itself. Now, this particular viewpoint has been subject to um, the objectors um, putting their own uh, view photo montage and submitting that to the County Planning Authority. The objectors of um, the photo montage has been submitted on behalf of the parish council's group, and that's explained in the top right-hand corner here. The parish council's group submitted on the 30, 31st of January uh, the photo at the top of the slide here, showing this the photo montage, the development here. However, members, I must point out that throughout the whole of the photo montages that I will show you this afternoon, um, I understand that the photo montages have used the um, former pre-application consultation photo montage, which had a viewpoint showing 80 metres high stack and a 45 metre high building. Sorry, I should point out that I, I have put on the slide the applicant's photos in order to allow members to compare the two photographs with one another. Uh, Legit Lane uh, at Coneythorpe has also been identified as being um, subject to moderate to large adverse visual impact. The photograph to the top here shows the planning authority's ver verification photograph and below the applicant's photograph showing the stack at 70 metres and the 36.4 metre high energy from waste building. This has been confirmed by the applicant as being the correct model for the photo montage. This viewpoint, again viewed by members on, site, on the site visit last week, shows the, um, the parish council submitted photograph at the top of the slide and the applicant's uh, photo montage sort of submitted with the application. Again, verification has been made with the uh, applicant's website and that is confirmed in a later report that has been published uh, for members which confirms that this particular development, you will see the air cooled condensers here, uh, are viewed differently to the model used here. Viewpoint 7 alongside the uh, A59 shows the view from the lay-by. Um, fortunately, um, members were able to stop um, at this lay-by to view the um, photo montages. 
on previous occasions when officers have been th there, um, it hasn't been possible to park in that lay-by, uh, but we were fortunately able to do so on the day of the visit. The photo montage uh, to the bottom here shows the applicant's um, uh, photo montage of the building, and this is the top photograph, the, the verification of that uh, viewpoint. Again, the Parish Council's uh, submitted a photograph uh, in January earlier this year in its uh, objection submission shows the photo montage here uh, mm -hmm. against the applicant's photo montage submitted uh, at the time of the application. Lylands Farm members will remember um, going along the private access road, which we were given permission to go along uh, to, uh, to view this particular viewpoint. Um, I should point out that members will recall seeing the stack in a different location on the site. This photo montage uh, shows the stack here where the light pen is. Actually, on the site visit, we saw the stack here in this location between the two trees, the two principal trees in the viewpoint. That um, had been ver has been verified with the applicant and confirmation um, has shown that this photo montage was indeed in error. Um, the crane was in the right uh, location. I do apologise, members. I should have mentioned the fact that there was a crane on the site on the day of the site visit. Do apologise. Um, the, um, the applicant was asked to verify the location of the crane. The location of the crane was verified. It has come to light that the, um, there was an error in calculations of magnetic north which changed the location of the stack on this particular photo montage. That error does not um, apply to all of the photo montages that have been supplied, but only this one. Okay. Um, again, um, for, um, for members' information and comparison, the Parish Council's group photograph is shown uh, to the top here uh, and the bottom, but as we know, the photo montage is actually showing the stack in the uh, different location. I should point out that in terms of having had this identified, the applicant has uh, confirmed and the consultant um, acting on behalf of the applicant has confirmed that it has not changed the assessment in uh, any way whatsoever in terms of visual impact by dint of that um, location in, a, in between the two trees here. Uh, this viewpoint here, members will recall um, walls close. Um, the properties to the right, uh, left-hand side sorry, of the photograph, again, a verification photograph by the planning authority taken in, in better weather, um, and the photograph, uh, photo montage of the chimney um, here behind the trees. I take the opportunity here on this particular photograph to point out sorry, the uh, property uh, to the right-hand side of the photograph, which also lie uh, in close proximity. That isn't South Farm. The photograph uh, to the top of the slide here again shows the Parish Council's um, uh, photograph. It does not uh, replicate the photo montage. I'm sure members will be able to, uh, to uh, see that for themselves that the uh, photo does not replicate the same photograph as put forward by the applicant. The photograph here shows the quarry entrance. Uh, members will recall standing here whilst looking at the quarry entrance and uh, the explanation of the, the highways works proposed as part of the development, showing the, um, the flue stack here at a height of 70 metres. In terms of visual impact assessment, it has been assessed that that impact reduces at year 15 to a lesser degree of impact. The photograph here is um, a photograph which, again, isn't comparable with that of the applicant's photograph by dint of the fact that the traffic sign here um, is, um, is different to the sign here. The photograph, I understand, again, um, apologies to repeat, but this photograph, I understand, is taken from the pre-application uh, documentation showing a slack height of 80 metres. 
Members will recall that there is one viewpoint of the 25 viewpoints that have been assessed as part of the uh, landscape and visual impact assessment um, that would experience a, a large degree of visual impact. Uh, this is uh, Nineveh Farm. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. Uh, Nineveh Farm. Um, and mm -hmm. this is the former uh, A168, which runs, gives access to the farm. The A168 lies behind uh, this uh, post and rail fence mm -hmm. to the right-hand side of the photograph here. Um, there is no, uh, in respect to this, there is no uh, submitted photograph on behalf of the Parish Council's group on this particular viewpoint. However, on this uh, viewpoint, members will recall we weren't able to stop the bus uh, to see this viewpoint, but views out of the, uh, towards the left out of the bus enabled views along the A1. It shows the, uh, the proposed development in the distance here. And again, an alternative uh, photograph su submitted as part of an objection by the Parish Council's group in uh, January shows the development here in this location here. Uh, Martin Congrafton um, is a, a photograph that uh, shows, if I point out to members, um, the flu stack is here. Apologies that it, it can look as if it's part of the hedgerow, but it's actually in this location here where the light pen is. The um, Parish Council group have all also um, submitted um, a photograph of the uh, stack, um, which again, I understand, is, uh, is part of the uh, photo montage from the previous um, pre-application stage. Sleeper Farm members, um, you'll recall my mentioning uh, that Sleeper Farm, well, we weren't able to visit Sleeper Farm However, for the sake of completeness and to ensure that members saw all the viewpoints that are assessed as being affected by the development, uh, it's shown in this photograph here. Uh, again, the verification photograph of the planning authority and a photograph to the photo montage of the applicant. Viewpoints 26. I mentioned there was um, 25 viewpoints assessed in the visual impact assessment, but there were also supplied to the authority other viewpoints in order to be able to give um, a uh, context to the particular development. This is a viewpoint from the, um, the overbridge at the A59 and the A1, going over the A1N. Uh, another viewpoint, viewpoint 27, uh, which is uh, just as you uh, get onto the east side of the uh, A59, uh, as you've uh, gone over the A1N. Um, finally, members, um, having gone through the viewpoints um, of the particular visual uh, landscape and visual impact assessment, I've also included here viewpoints from locations within the registered park and garden, which haven't been part of the uh, assessment, but allow members to be able to see the impact from the actual registered park and garden. Um, it hasn't been part of the assessment, and it is explained in the committee report that, that by dint of no public access um, to that uh, registered park and garden, that's why it hasn't uh, been assessed as such. The main viewpoints have been assessed and used the criteria of public access, such as public footpaths and highways uh, and residential properties. The viewpoints taken here um, show a view from the Temple of Victory. Um, again, the Planning Authority's verification photograph at the top of the slide and the viewpoint from the Temple of Victory uh, showing that the, this is the applicant's photo montage of what one would expect to see um, if the application uh, were to be, um, if the proposal were to be built. The uh, viewpoint here, um, again, members um, were able to see um, the crane um, during the day of the site visit um, on the, from the registered park and garden. 
The uh, viewpoint 29 again shows the stack uh, in the bottom photograph here, the applicant's photo. And viewpoint 31, uh, taken from the terrace, members will recall uh, walking uh, to the terrace of uh, Allerton Castle uh, and seeing the view uh, that, uh, that, that can be taken from that particular uh, place uh, in front of the castle itself. Sorry. Members um, are pointed to the fact that there is a, a photograph submitted by the Parish Council's group uh, on this particular photograph, on this particular viewpoint, and that Parish Council's group photo is uh, um, here at the top of the slide. I did say finally earlier on, but finally. <laughs> um, members will, um, have, uh, re will recall reading in the report that there is mention of listed structures uh, that are proposed uh, to be uh, part of the conservation, repair and maintenance work schedule. There are seven listed structures within the registered park and garden. And as members could only see three of those structures, I have photographs for you this afternoon. The first of the photographs is the arched entrance to the boathouse on the island of Lower Fish Pond. Um, members' um, attention is drawn to the fact that all of these listed structures are in the ownership of uh, Lord Mowbray. There are two ownerships on the registered park and garden, Lord Mowbray and uh, Dr Rolfe, um, who owns Allerton Castle. So this is the first of seven structures identified for uh, repair works and conservation works. Um, the second photograph shows just a section of the uh, boundary wall. Um, it doesn't give a complete picture in terms of the condition of the wall. In some places, it's completely missing. In other places, it's dilapidated uh, and uh, fallen down. Um, however, for the purposes of the presentation this afternoon, um, this is a, a slide purely to give uh, an impression of what the uh, park boundary wall looks like. Members will recall on the site visit um, in the, the um, tour around the estate showing, um, seeing uh, various sections of the boundary wall. Um, ladies, uh, the, the bridge between Middle and Lower Fish Pond is shown here in the uh, photograph as uh, needing works to repair and conserve. The, the um, Lady's Cave, or uh, the Folly, um, it's sometimes known and sometimes referred to in the conservation um, documents as Lady's Cave, is another one. The Ice House, members will recall um, being stood near the uh, edge of the lake and uh, viewing the, uh, a view um, up the hill towards the actual ice house itself. Second to last one is the uh, tunnel to the, to the pleasure grounds. And the last photograph is the boathouse on the southern bank of the lower fish pond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And if members bear with me, I'll just have a drink. <laughs> Has anybody got a burning question? On that? An yeah. Andrew. Andrew Goss. Mm -hmm. Councillor Goss. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> First question is, with regard to um, the, uh, the site visit, we went on the site visit, it was very foggy, we couldn't see anything, we could hardly see the top of the crane. Now, um, in your photographs, you... you um, you say this, is, this will be the height of the projected height of the flue stack, but in, the, in, the, in actual fact, it will not include the, flu, the, <coughs> the, plume, <coughs> the plume from this um, uh, flue stack. So um, the, <coughs> the, the flue stack itself will still be visible, and the plume itself will be visible. So there will be it will have a huge impact upon that landscape scene. Uh, there's no question that it won't. Is that correct? 
<coughs> Councillor Goss, uh, yes, um, I'll refer you in the report. Um, it does mention about the plume and the period of time when the plume would be expected to be visible. Um, it, it acknowledges the existence of the plume and does not suggest that it, uh, it will have no impact whatsoever in terms of, uh, in terms of its, its, its vision in the um, locality. However, um, the applicant has, in, has stated in the application that the uh, plume is expected to, um, to uh, be limited to the uh, site boundary itself for the majority of the time and if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, 5% of the time, it would extend beyond the site boundary. Yes, sorry, the other, other question is, with regard to Harrogate uh, Borough... I think the detail for that will be explained later in the report, if you're prepared to oh. wait until then. Councillor Nags. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Firstly, to you, Chairman, could I congratulate both sides, for and against, on the very good presentations today. I think it's some of the best of the 20 years I've been here that I've heard for quite some time, and I congratulate them. I do object, actually, to being accused of making up my mind beforehand by, especially from somebody from Ripon. After being here 20 years, you soon learn when not to predetermine, especially on something like this. And I don't like to think that any of the members of this committee have done that anyway. They wanted to see what happened here today, and that's what I wanted to see. I'm pleased we had the site meeting, Chairman. It's one of the best site meetings I've been to as well. We needed that site meeting to see, and I'm pleased I took on board what was there before us. I was a little concerned about the enhanced photographs. I don't think that did the uh, people against this any good whatsoever. I think you ought to put the genuine photographs up rather than the enhanced ones. Other than that, Chairman, I thank them for coming, and I think they're doing a very good job on presenting their cases today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as is normally the case um, with presenting applications to members, um, the sections one to six are considered as being read unless there are any queries with those sections. Um, I will, would like to update members before actually progressing into the main considerations part of the report. Just so um, members are aware and members of the public uh, and the applicant are aware of the existence of other reports that have had to be published in the intervening period uh, from the publication of the substantive report. So members will have received their plan pack, which I've referred to earlier, uh, of the A3 plans. Members will also have received a supplementary report That supplementary report raised a, a number of issues um, which had been um, submitted to the County Council post the publication of the substantive report. And to avoid, um, uh, sorry, it was a sub supplementary report uh, in front of members to update on matters that had been raised since the publication. We then produced an addendum report. Um, to identify uh, matters of publication where there was cross-referencing in terms of par paragraph numbers. As is the case with the, a substantial document of th some 386 pages, um, inevitably uh, section referencing and cross-referencing of paragraph numbers uh, does tend to, to go awry. So the purpose of the addendum report is to update members on the corrections there. Uh, most, the most recent of the reports has been the uh, summary of late representations and miscellaneous updates and also a revised schedule of conditions for members. Can I assume that all members have received those papers? Thank you, members. In respect of uh, updates to the... Um, uh, report. Could I turn members in the substantive report to paragraph 
Pays three point one three two. Page 34, members. Mm. Uh, members, in that um, paragraph, um, I refer to uh, the time period for determination. Um, with this particular application, as with all application, there is a set period of time by which applicants can expect to have a determination of their applications. And it is only by agreement with both parties, both the County Planning Authority and the applicant, that that uh, extension of time can be agreed. Um, an extension of time to the 13th, 13th of November uh, has been recently agreed uh, by the applicant. So I need to correct members that it's not the 31st tomorrow, but the 13th of November. Members, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that late last night um, the County Planning Authority received a late representation. However, um, the representation adds no new issue uh, to, the de to the determination of this particular application and its assessment. Uh, members will not have received that as it was received at such a late, uh, late time. Um, if I point members now to this supplementary report. And may I refer members to page 11 of that report, paragraph 5.7. That conveyed members uh, in that report to the fact that the, the authority had received representation uh, from Dr. Rolfe and indeed the manager of Allerton Castle um, to state that they had not received any um, a, um, approach from the company to access the property of Dr. Rolfe. However, I have received representation, albeit verbally, from the company that a best endeavours were um, undertaken to gain access to assess Dr. Rolf's land and gain access for the viewpoints. As opposed to an actual um, update, I'd like to uh, put forward a, a point of clarification, if I may, uh, on the substantive report, uh, page. Um, paragraph 3.13 and 3.14. That is on page 11 of your uh, substantive report in front of your members. There is a possibility of uh, misunderstanding or misrepresentation in the report, so it's important, members, that I explain the figures that are set out in uh, those two paragraphs of the report. The uh, maximum vehicle numbers per day during the construction period, as, as is said in the report, are estimated by the applicant to be 258 per day. It then goes on to say, of the 258 movements, 142 movements are expected to be HGVs. <coughs> now, members, the construction period is anticipated to take a length of 34 months. And the figures in there are explaining that the maximum vehicle numbers is maximum staff vehicle numbers and a maximum that would be experienced in any one month on that 34 month period. The applicant has provided the information um, showing that in month, in month 18 of the 34-month development, 258 vehicle movements, staff vehicle movements, would be experienced. That's the maximum vehicle movements that would be experienced 
um, and any one day during that 34-month period, it does not suggest that there's maximum uh, of 258 movements would be every day of that 34-month period. Similarly, um, on uh, the maximum HGV movements, the maximum HGVs would indeed be 142, but that maximum would only be experienced in month seven of the 34-month period. In respect of paragraph 3.14, during the operational phase of the development, the maximum HGV movements would indeed be 302 per day. However, staff and visitors would be 160 per day, 80 vehicles in and 80 vehicles out. It's incumbent on me to, to make sure that members um, are, do have that as a point of clarification this afternoon. Holt, would you like to close? Just, just, uh, just a clarification in the movement. It was saying that, they'd say, it's 258 per day, it may well be less. But if it's averaged over a month, does that mean on any individual day it might actually be more, as long as the average over the month is 258? Um, Councillor Holt, um, the graph that I have been provided shows that as a maximum on... Uh, that would be experienced on a day in that particular month. So it would not uh, exceed that. Members. Section 7, Main Considerations. Page 159 of your agenda papers, uh, of the substantive report, members. Members, um, I'm instructed to um, ensure that I provide the opportunity to uh, have questions at particular breaks during the um, main considerations section, and I'll endeavour to do so uh, on a regular basis. So for the, the points that I'm going to be raising uh, now, we'll deal with the first uh, part of section seven, uh, which um, deals first with the, the context that we're of the development that we're talking about, um, and then um, I will provide. I will stop there. I'll pause there to enable questions. Okay. Um, in section for the first part of um, section seven, um, the report explains that uh, this particular proposal uh, falls to the county council rather than the Harrogate Borough Council for determination, as it is a county matter dealing with. Uh, waste manage, a waste management proposal. Uh, albeit it is an energy uh, from waste development, it is dealing with wet, principally dealing with waste and therefore falls under the jurisdiction of the County Council. With respect to the context of the site uh, and this actual proposal itself, the context is in um, national policy terms and legis legislative terms drivers to move waste, the management of waste up the hierarchy. It's also a driver of diversion 
of municipal solid waste and biodegradable waste away from landfill itself, a traditional means of disposal of municipal solid waste. The proposal in front of you is specifically in front of you this afternoon as a direct uh, result of delivering the joint municipal waste management strategy for York and North Yorkshire sub-region. That explains the context and the drivers, the principal drivers behind the proposal in front of you this afternoon. Um, the report then goes on to look at the locational uh, policies that direct this particular proposal to this location. The context of the uh, locational policies within the development plan can be found within a number of documents. The first of those documents includes the North Yorkshire Waste Local Plan and policies 5.3 and 5.10, which are explained in the report. If I remind members, um, at paragraph 7.15 on page 163, the starting point for deciding this application is the development plan itself. Applications should be decided in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate a decision otherwise. Whilst the development plan remains the starting point for consideration of this application, it will be necessary when considering the proposals in relation to the full range of relevant planning policy to have regard to relevant elements of more recent national policy as important material considerations which may indicate a different approach to that followed in the development plan. So moving on to the development plan and the locational policies themselves. The majority of the area proposed for development is subject to mineral permissions. These mineral permissions contain restoration conditions. The existence of extant restoration conditions requiring restoration in this case to agriculture and woodland means that the site does not constitute what's termed previously developed or brownfield land. It's therefore, it isn't, uh, therefore, it's not the subject of policy support in that respect i.e. the reuse of such land. In planning terms, the majority of the site therefore comprises open countryside. This is despite it comprising an area which has been subject to significant disturbance from minerals and waste development over a substantial period of time and where further development could continue under current temporary permissions. Within the report, mention is made of the permissions for the landfill site um, extant until 2018. It is quite possible that further permissions would be uh, submitted to the County Planning Authority for an extension to those permissions. Paragraph number. Sorry, that was 7.27. Sorry, members. <coughs> So in respect to the North Yorkshire Waste Local Plan, the 7.28 paragraph number on page 166, the site is not subject of any specific allocation in the development plan. There are two allocated sites, and the report goes on to explain that those allocated sites have been discounted from the site search assessment undertaken in respect to this proposal. However, in terms of a power of policy 5.2, the plan does not preclude the granting of permission on other sites, so long as they're judged against the other policies that are contained in Chapter 5 of that plan. It's not considered that any impact on restoration and after use would be unacceptable. The, there are elements within the, the development where the mechanical treatment element of the proposal would be broadly consistent with policy 5.3. However, 5.10 of the policy, sec and paragraph 7.37, 4.3 and 
for proposals dealing with incineration of waste, there are a number of criteria that criteria land locations within that policy. However, it cannot be set, similarly said in respect to policy 510 that policy support can be found in that particular policy. Seven four point four four on page one six eight. For this reason, it's not possible to conclude that the proposal as a whole is directed, is directly supported by specific locational criteria within the North Yorkshire Waste Local Plan. Although neither is it considered that a high degree of conflict with such criteria arises, or that any, or that the degree of any such conflict would in itself be sufficient to warrant refusal. Moving on to the uh, policies of the regional spatial strategy, and this is of course taking into account the, um, the government's intention to revoke the strategy, uh, it still remains in force as an extent, extent part of the development plan, and therefore due regard has to be had to that, that policy, That's that strategy, sorry. Policy EMV 14, of, in paragraph 7.48, indicates waste should be, should be managed on the site where it arises or at the nearest appropriate location, and that major sources of waste arising in rural areas should be treated locally unless specialised facilities are required. 749 it's acknowledged that the proposal is not consistent with the highest locational preference within the RSS. However, whilst not previously developed land, the development will be located largely within the boundary of a permission that has experienced significant mineral extraction and landfill activity over the years. Overall, it is considered that the proposals receive some support from locational pri priority order in EMV 14. Moving on to the policies of the Harrogate Borough Local Plan um, and the policies of the core strategy, the more recent document adopted by the uh, Borough Council. It should be noted that these plans have not been adopted with the express intention of dealing with waste management proposals but more general development that falls under the jurisdiction of Harrogate Borough Council. However, where those policies uh, can be argued as being relevant, um, the policy, the, the uh, proposal in respect of Clare House um, is considered to be compatible with policy E8 of the plan. Sorry, members, I'm reading from 7.54, page 170. As mentioned earlier, the land in which this application uh, is proposed is classed as open countryside, and that again is expressed in core strategy policy SG3. The title of that policy is Settlement Growth, and therefore its main thrust of the policy is in relation to to development proposals uh, in respect of development that would come fall under the jurisdiction in normal circumstances by Harrogate Borough Council. The proposed site is not located within the development or infill limits and is not development in, and is development in open countryside. It should be noted that the core strategy um, is the most recently adopted part of the development plan. Um, with potential relevance to the proposals. It's acknowledged in the report, however, the same um, concern and same um, policy status as I've just alluded to, um, in that it was not drafted and adopted with waste management proposals in mind. And therefore, that is also uh, mirrored in the officer report of Harrogate Borough Council in their comments on this particular application. Um, members should also note that more recent policy on development in rural areas is also provided in the National Planning Policy Framework. This indicates that planning policies should support economic growth in rural areas, 
This is paragraph 7.359 on page 171. This indicates that planning policy should support economic growth in rural areas in order to create jobs and prosperity by taking a positive approach to new development. This aspect of the national planning policy framework um, is not ex expressed um, uh, per se as a development control policy. However, it does suggest that the approach of S S um, SG3 and policy E8 of the Borough Local Plan may not be compatible with the most up-to-date national planning policy position, which appears to adopt a more flexible and positive approach to such developments. Whilst the development as a whole may not conform to the policies, the extent of any conflict in this particular instance is considered to be mitigated. Moving on to um, the uh, number four, uh, and the fourth uh, element of locational criteria against which this development has been assessed is planning policy document, um, planning policy statement number 10, which is uh, one of the, uh, the remaining uh, planning policy statement um, after the publication of the National Planning Policy Framework. So that planning policy statement is still extant for development control purposes. Again, that um, indicates a priority uh, preference order for sites, suggesting that, waste, that county planning authorities, waste planning authorities, should I say, should consider a broad range of locations, including industrial start, uh, sites, looking, sorry, paragraph 7.62, looking for opportunities to co-locate facilities together and complementary activities. This suggests that a degree of flexibility should be applied in determining locations. In this context, it's relevant that the proposal would involve the co-location of a number of complementary facilities which would operate in combination to provide for further recycling and recovery of residual waste. Paragraph 7.65 refers to paragraph uh, 21 of that same planning policy statement, which explains that, it should, that priority should be given to the reuse and previously developed land and redundant and agricultural forestry buildings and their curtilages. The policy in PPS 10 is not expressed as an absolute requirement, but instead is expressed as a priority preference to guide waste disposal authorities. Moving on to the National Planning Policy Framework, uh, that was published in, um, uh, on the 27th of March of this year and uh, had immediate effect, was published with immediate effect. Um, the MPPF does not contain specific waste, uh, policies for waste, as I previously mentioned. The application site does not constitute uh, previously developed land or PDL land. However, the use of such land is expressed in, that, in the framework as a policy preference rather than an overriding requirement. In conclusion, on this particular element of the section seven of the report, it's acknowledged that the proposals do not fully accord with certain policies in the development plan. Although for reasons discussed earlier, it is not considered that the extended conflict would be sufficient in itself to justify refusal of permission. The degree of flexibility afforded in current policy suggests that the overall extent of any conflict with locational policy is relatively slight. Councillor yeah. Goff. With regard, uh, regard to Harrogate Borough Council's concerns, they were concerned about um, a number of uh, uh, policies that were conflicting with their uh, local plan. And you suggested that, 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 that those policies were minimal. Uh, they would not be significant to, enough to refuse this application. Um, could you tell me which policies you considered were minimal and not really relevant to the particular application? Yes, Councillor. Um, I think 
Um, if I may suggest that minimal is probably not the right word to use uh, in this regard. Um, the, it's the weight that um, has been given to those particular policies when one considers that those policies weren't drafted and weren't adopted with waste management proposals in mind. Members, there are two particular points um, uh, that um, remain on this particular part of, uh, of the main consideration section that I'd just like to, uh, to make reference to as um, they have been referred to in speeches that you've heard today. Um, there are two particular aspects, and that's with regards to uh, prematurity, which has been raised as an issue. Um, Members will see in the report uh, explanation with regards to prematurity, uh, paragraph 7.73 on, uh, on 173, and that explains that the, um, the yes, indeed, members will recall that the uh, work on the um, minerals and waste development framework um, was uh, withdrawn and uh, work commenced, recommenced uh, again on that work as a result of the uh, indications of the uh, inspector ex at the examination in public. The work and the, the plan, the schedule for the uh, adoption of, uh, of the local plan, as they'll refer be referred to in future rather than course strategy and LDFs, um, is likely to be some time off in the future. And that some time is going to be a significant amount of time between the determination on this particular application. The work on that isn't sufficiently progressed to justify and to support an argument of prematurity in this particular instance. And therefore, um, noting the um, context within the paragraphs within the report, in the absence of uh, any expectation um, in the uh, production of, not let alone the, the overarching strategic policies, um, as opposed to site allocations, it would be difficult to justify refusal of this particular proposal um, on the grounds of prematurity. Sorry, members, um, I didn't point to the paragraph that I was referring to. Uh, it was paragraph 7.83. Many apologies. <clears throat> um, the second point that has also been uh, mentioned in speeches today um, has been the, um, the proximity principle and nearest appropriate in installation. Paragraphs uh, 7.84 to uh, 790 on pages 176 and 177. They refer to uh, an explanation that proximity principle uh, used to exist in a prior, um, uh, previous incarnation of PPS 10. Um, it also exists as part of policy four, one of the minerals, uh, sorry, the waste local plan. Um, however, more the, um, most recent publication of PPS 10, uh, March 2011, uh, does not make reference to proximity principle as being the guiding uh, rule for developments of this nature. Instead, it refers to nearest appropriate installation, and that is um, a following the golden thread from the European directive about the nearest appropriate installation. It's possible that the location of waste management facilities, paragraph 7.90, um, it's possible that the location and, as a consequence, the extended compliance with the nearest appropriate 
installation requirement can be influenced by the choice of waste management technology. However, the choice of, method, of the method and technology is essentially a commercial decision for the market. The County Council, as a planning authority, is not expressed in any policy document, any policy preference as to the technologies which may, may be preferred, and thereby the location of those, uh, of those waste management facilities. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Do you want me to continue with any other questions? Um, no, carry on. Nobody's indicated that they have a question. Members, moving on in the, the um, in, through the main considerations of the report, um, the section seven then continues to address the environmental effects of the proposed development. In the first instance, the design of the proposed development is discussed in the light of the objections raised against it. Criticisms include the inappropriate industrial look of the facility in an open countryside location, as well as a flu, flu stack causing visual impact. Having assessed the design philosophy and the elements of the built environment, along with the responses to consultation, the view taken raises no con cogent reason to refuse the uh, proposal on the basis of design alone. Members appointed to uh, paragraph 7100 on page 179, where the um, report makes reference to consultation with the former commission of the, for architecture and the built environment which is now uh, sub subsumed into the Design Council. The Design Council has, uh, and it is reproduced in that paragraph, uh, their uh, response in respect of this particular application, having been consulted, um, they uh, refer to the development as commending the visual impact assessment. They've also um, highlighted the fact that they believe it will be a de well-designed facility. The building strikes, and I'm quoting from, the, um, from CABE, the building strikes the right balance between a simple industrial appearance and a compelling, elegant design. They have not returned any objection in respect of design, and therefore there is no cogent planning reason to refuse on that ground alone. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nag. No, thank you, Chairman. On 794... I gather the applicants uh, put in reducing the stack and the building. Is this the limit they can go down to to get the results that they're looking for? They can't go any lower. That, that, that's it, is it? That's as far as they're prepared to go to get the results that they require. Councillor Nags, thank you very much for pointing that out for me. Um, the, um, the design has changed from its pre-application uh, design. Mm. Um, reducing the stack height from 80 metres to 70 metres and reducing the size of the building. However, I understand that the um, stack height itself is determined by the, the air dispersion, dispersion modelling and therefore for health and safety reasons and dispersion reasons, that stack height will not reduce um, by dint of just playing with design. It actually is a height to uh, disperse um, in the uh, air dispersion modelling scenario. Well, that's, that's the, the lowest light, height they're prepared to go to to get the results that they require. Yeah. Um, Thank you. It's, it's my understanding that that is what is... Uh, on both the building and the, and the stack. Both on the building and the stack. Uh, that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Members, the next um, environmental effect that is assessed in the uh, main considerations of the, uh, in the report um, is found on page eight, 181 at uh, paragraph, uh, starting with paragraph 7.112, 112, which uh, assesses landscape and visual impact. Members will have heard uh, today 
the concerns of uh, local residents and those objecting to the development um, as to the location of the development in open countryside. Um, that is recognised that the site is in open countryside. It isn't, however, located in an area of land which is designated for its landscape quality. It, doesn't, uh, it is not sited in an area of outstanding natural beauty, nor is sited in any of the national parks. The application has been accompanied by a landscape and visual impact assessment, and that is uh, included in the environmental statement accompanying the application. As mentioned in the presentation, there are five, uh, sorry, 25 viewpoints assessed. Seven were assessed as experiencing moderate to large adverse impact at year one. Viewpoint 10 um, fell into a slight um, impact in year 15. But one of those was experiencing large impact, and that was at Nineveh Farm. In terms of landscape character areas, landscape character areas 69 and 91 were assessed as experiencing moderate impact. A significant number of objections raised in respect to this proposal contend that the impact on the, upon the landscape is so significant that, it, that by dint of that it's contrary to policy. The proposal has been assessed against the relevant policies which are in, identified at 7120 of your report in front of you on page 183. Paragraphs on pages 184 over the page and 185 assess the development proposal against the policies of the Harrogate Borough Council local plan and core strategy. And notwithstanding the specific focus of these policies being matters under the jurisdiction of the Borough Council rather than the County Council, to the extent that they can be considered relevant, there is considered to be only a limited degree of compliance with these particular policies. With respect to landscape character areas, notwithstanding the general description of the nature of the area as a rolling arable landscape, it's recognised that it, there exist pockets within that landscape that give scope for development opportunities, Allerton Quarry being one such site. May I refer members to paragraph 7.186 on page... Bear with me, I'll get there. Thank you. On page 195 of your agenda papers this afternoon. The County of North Yorkshire possesses substantial areas of designated landscapes, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty, national parks and heritage coasts, etc., together with locally safeguarded areas of special landscape value. These are generally associated with parts of the county with greater topographical relief. Objectors contend that the facility is incapable of being entirely screened and will result in a wholly unacceptable visual impact. It's acknowledged that the siting of the development with a lower-lying, gently undulating landscape is likely to increase its zone of visual influence, i.e. it could be seen for a greater distance in such a landscape. However, if the development were to be located in a landscape of greater relief, as in greater topographical distance, and thereby reducing the building's zone of visual influence within the landscape, there's a greater likelihood of the development conflicting with more rigorous policy tests associated with such landscapes. This would likely be the case were a site to be found in many such locations which are similarly in non-designated landscapes. Furthermore, it is also considered that any site that is likely to be readily accessible to the principal road network, as stated as a need for this development, is also likely to be in a location with relatively high numbers of passing visual receptors. However, notwithstanding that, there remains a significant, significant impact resulting from the development the proposed site is considered to be one which, which has, notwithstanding the, the 
uh, remains a significant impact resulting from the development, the proposed site is considered to be one which has the, the benefit of substantial existing screening by way of topography and mature landscaping, in which both the immediate vicinity of the site and, it, and its environs, whilst with the acknowledged exception of the nearby registered park and garden, safeguarding highly valued designated landscapes. It should be no noted that Natural England does not object to the proposal on landscape and visual impact grounds and considers that the proposal is unlikely to have a significant impact upon the N Nidderdale or Howardian Hills AONB. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Goff would like to ask a question. That's all With regard to <clears throat> visibility from, from um, Allison Park and the castle, um, we, we viewed it from the terraces. Uh, this is a viewpoint from the terraces, but we couldn't see it. We can't see anything. We couldn't see the, the crane or the, um, in the quarry there. Um, could you tell me how much of the um, plant itself will be visible above the tree line uh, from that terrace in, at, at Alliston Park? Also from the Temple of Victory as well. How much will be visible from those two viewpoints? Councillor Goss, I, I do apologise. I, I was going to go on my next bit on the historic environment, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer. Would you like me to go back to the, the, the photo which shows the view from the terrace? Bear with me. Uh, right. The, the terrace uh, location, uh, we're stood on the terrace. Um, I should point out the council's photograph is the top photograph. The applicant's photograph, as part of the application document, shows the uh, stack here in this location here. Um, I, I did do um, a check with officers attending the site visit, and, and I should point out that on every single viewpoint that we went to, we could see the crane on the site. So we could see the crane, albeit I do acknowledge that it was foggy on the day, and that rendered the visibility difficult, but it was seen. Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I'm afraid I I haven't the information to be able to give you, Councillor Goss, on on the the remaining. I apologise. Sorry, Councillor Goss, you mentioned the Temple of Victory as well? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, um, we don't have a view from the Temple of Victory, do we? Do you mean from the Temple of Victory? That's, that's from Temple of Victory. Did you, did you mean the view from the Temple of Victory, yeah. Councillor Goss? Yeah. Sorry, the, the view from the Temple of Victory is this location here. It is, however, I, I should point out to members that public access to the Temple of Victory is not readily available. Uh, it isn't, and this is the, the purpose is why I explained in the, the um, presentation that these haven't been assessed in the same way as other viewpoints by dint of them not being publicly accessible. Would you like me to just do? Shall I leave that there up on the screen? Mm. Yes. Shall I leave that up there? Members, with respect to the historic environment, um, the I'm not moving to the historic, the heritage part of, of uh, the main considerations. There is a degree of overlap between the heritage aspects of the and impact of the development and landscape. Uh, they do share. Um, uh, um, they do have shared boundaries in terms of discipline. Um, so, in respect to the landscape chapter, there is a discussion within there. 
<coughs> with regards to the historic landscape, and that specifically uh, concerns the historic battlefield sites and conservation areas which are located within villages surrounding the development. However, no conflict is considered to exist in this from the, from, in respect of uh, those particular historic landscapes. Um, and the expert advisor, uh, English Heritage, uh, in respect of historic battlefields, has also confirmed that uh, there is no conflict arising and therefore has not returned no objection in this respect. However, the County Council's expert advisor on landscape matters has returned his professional opinion in respect of historic landscape um, with specific regard to the registered park and garden and the wider landscape beyond the bounds of the application site. Discussion within the report on the issues relating to the historic landscape and beyond can be found on pages 189 to 192 of the report. Sorry, members, I have backtracked a bit. <laughs> the County Council's expert advisor on landscape matters has recognised that the applicant has sought to address the significant la adverse landscape impact which has been assessed as resulting from the proposed development. The applicant has put forward a landscape management strategy informed by a conservation management plan. The proposal is to set up a fund to which applications could be made for landscape and cultural heritage works within a radius of 3.5 kilometres of the site. The landscape architect is supportive and has returned no objection on this matter. And bear with me. Sorry, my eyes are watering. <laughs> <laughs> Members, moving on to the heritage matters. Was it Councillor Nags? No, I'll just, let's just save the questions that we're getting to. I'll be... Confirmation, Chairman. Allerton Park, at any time in the year, is not open to the public. Is that correct? Councillor Nags, I'm not aware that members of the public can enter Allerton Castle, no, the Allerton Castle part of the site, the no, Temple I mean, of Victory. I mean the park itself. The park itself, um, I'm not aware that there's general public access at within all. the park and garden. Okay, thank you. They've been showing us pictures for the public. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Councillor Nags, uh, Councillor Nags, um, I was going to say when we said that the park itself and the wider area, uh, there are two separate. Yes, there are. There are two separate ownerships. And I am aware, because I have seen the sign outside of Allerton Castle that said that viewings by appointment can be made to see view Allerton Castle. But for the wider area, there isn't public access. Just, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't just turn up and say, I want to have a wonder. <laughs> On the site meeting with the two separate properties, we were looking at sites from the park towards Allerton Park to the application where the site's going to be. The reason I'm asking the question, why is it, if it's not open to the public, then you know there's nobody going to look at it from there except for the castle and the people that own the park. It's not open to the public, isn't the park, as far as you know? Yes or no? Is the park yes, open to the public? Yes no, or no? It's, it's, it's not generally open to Thank you. members of the public. Thank you. You've got the answer. Uh, Count, Councillor Nags, because it's not open to the public, doesn't mean to say it doesn't need consideration. Yes, but there could have been a lot more objectors if it yeah. had been, okay. Chairman. Members, moving on to heritage. 
Uh, sorry, page uh, 198 of the, uh, of the substantive report. <coughs> I'm endeavouring members to try and summarise as much as possible uh, rather than going verbatim on the, the paragraphs in the report, so please bear with me. The environmental statement carried out by the applicant asserts that there will be no direct impact upon assets of historic interest and the County Council's expert advisor on these matters, English Heritage, concurs with this assertion. However, notwithstanding the, the absence of direct impact, it's incumbent on the County Planning Authority to have regard to the setting of those assets, as setting is explained at paragraph 7.200 on page 199. There are a number of listed buildings, both within and beyond the bounds of the Register Park and Garden. These are identified in paragraph 7.205. The applicant has assessed the significance of the heritage assets, and that assessment has not been challenged by the expert advisers of, at English Heritage. This is explained in paragraph 7.205. 209 to 213. Page 201 and 202. The assessment of impact by the applicant has concluded that large adverse effects arise in respect of both Allerton Castle and the Temple of Victory. English Heritage, the statutory consultee and advisor to the County Council, has reviewed the applicant's assessment and has returned a view that the overall harm to the significance of the assets is termed as less than substantial. In seeking in part to mitigate such impact and in another way to offset the impact, the applicant has put forward a conservation management plan to specifically address works to seven listed structures within the park and garden. These are listed in paragraphs uh, paragraph 7.230 of the report. Those structures members will recall seeing in the presentation earlier of the, uh, the seven structures. These works... Uh, the, these works would be, are proposed to be covenanted with the County Council by legal agreement with the landowner Lord Mowbray the, and the, uh, com the applicant company. In addition, English Heritage recognises that further monies in the form of a landscape and, landscape and cultural heritage fund would provide additional monies for works to uh, be undertaken to assets of historical interest. In light of this, in light of the works to the identified structures and the prospect of monies coming to, coming to fruition in respect of works to other listed structures uh, in the th um, 3.5 kilometres uh, of the application site, there is no, is no objection returned by English Heritage in respect of this particular proposal. Moving to pages 212 and 219, sorry, 212, 219. The, um, the paragraphs on those pages um, concern themselves with the impact of the development and the assessment of the development in respect of impact on residential amenity. The first of the impacts identified is that of air quality, pollution and the impact on human health, which of course is of major concern to objectors to this proposal. The County Council has undertaken extensive consultation in respect to this application over and above its statutory duty to do so 
and the other um, consultees have included the Health Protection Agency, the Food Standards Agency and the NHS. The statutory uh, consultee in respect to this matter is the Environmental Health Officer, as well as the Environment Agency. All of those um, consultees have either returned comment or have raised no objection uh, to the proposal. There's further reference uh, in the report um, to a matter that has been raised today in respect to the proposal about the precautionary principle. If I may, could I refer members to paragraph 7.263 uh, of the report on page 214? Representations have been received from those objection, objecting to the proposed development, stating that the planning authority should apply the propor, propor, precautionary principle approach to determining this application. This has not been reflected in response to statutory consultation, and indeed, to take such a, an approach would require a circumstance where the proposed development itself had been identified as having potentially dangerous as well as adverse effects in, cli in a climate of identified scientific uncertainty. However, the development is put forward in front of you today is proposing the operation of, in quotes, a tried and tested technology in use over a number of years. It is not, therefore, considered that the proposal would give rise to a circumstance where the proportion precautionary principle would need to be invoked. In respect of noise and vibration, the Environmental Health Officer has also been consulted on this particular matter. The officer has returned comment and is satisfied that a condition to safeguard the amenity of nearby local residents at South Farm would be warranted as a means of control and that would be appropriate in this instance. Members will be drawn uh, later to the uh, revised schedule of conditions attached to the late representations report that includes a condition with respect to noise. With respect to the issue of odour, similarly this would apply as a condition would be appropriate in this instance. With respect to dust and litter, again appropriate conditions can be, can be imposed which would render the development acceptable in planning terms. Yeah. My question is regard, with regard to emissions from the uh, flu stack. Um, the CO2 emissions, have they been taken into account as, um, uh, which will increase, will, will definitely increase our greenhouse gases in, within the area? Could you tell me whether they have been taken into account? Councillor Goss, um, within the report, later in the report, um, I will get to the uh, matter of green, uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. However, I can actually say that the, um, the greenhouse gases, the, the, the offset of not landfilling um, is explained, and I will explain that later in the report. <laughs> You're getting ahead of us, Councillor Goff. If you just wait a little bit, it'll catch you up. Yeah, uh, Councillor Blades, is yours a current question? It is, Chair, thank you. Yeah, I'm on about the noise and the odour uh, and the dust. And um, earlier on in the report, we saw the tipping hall. And it says how many uh, movements there is on the lorries coming in. I think it's one every two minutes. But I presume it's because those doors are closed. It says it's going to be a fast closing door or something. But... Every two minutes, I think maybe there's a chance the doors will be left open. And I think they need the doors closed for a negative pressure into the system. Can you comment on that, Vicky? What, I mean, presumably, all these are with the doors closed. But in actual fact, there's so many lorries coming in and out, the doors probably will be left open. And so therefore, there's a risk of the dust and noise and odour escaping. Councillor Blades, um, with respect to a development of, uh, of this nature, um, the management systems that would apply would ensure that the uh, doors are closed 
um, for ensuring the negative pressure to reduce the odours. And indeed, it's not just the planning authority um, controlling such odours, um, which deemed appropriate in this particular instance, but there's also the permit uh, conditions that they would have to apply to as well, as well as the company's own environmental management system. Is it a, is it a one way system? Is it a one-way system into that? They're coming in and then and out? Uh, it is Councillor Blades, yes, it's a one-way system. Okay. Members, um, the next... the. The next pages to refer you to are 219 to 222. Members, I'll refer you to the, um, the bottom of the page um, on 219, which refers to matters of health and uh, safety, health hazards, risks and safety. Start again. With respect to hazards, risks and safety, um, the uh, paragraphs within the report explain, and it, it is quite uh, timely, the uh, previous mentions about um, hazards and an odour and health effects um, is that the the proposed development would undoubtedly um, and I understand a permit application is in um, uh, is being assessed at the moment by the Environment Agency. This particular development would be subject to an integrated pollution <laughs> prevention control permit, um, and it would. Um, it would be controlled by the Environment Agency. So in this particular instance, it's considered that the planning authority should have um, confidence and comfort that uh, controls that are under the jurisdiction of other controlling authorities should be uh, conducted to the best of their ability. Um, with respect to landfill gas migration, it is recognised and acknowledged within the application documents that the adjacent um, landfill site, previously operated by, by Waste Recycling Group, now operated by FCC Environmental, um, has experienced a degree of migration of landfill gas uh, from that site. In light of this, the proposal um, includes four safeguarding measures which would uh, include the um, laying of a, an impermeable concrete slab to a specification that would uh, prevent the accumulation of landfill gas into this particular development, any enclosed space. Uh, the greatest threat on landfill gas migration is producing an enclosed space um, and therefore the build-up of gas. So measures were put forward um, by, at the con building control stage to ensure that landfill gas migration um, was not an issue uh, with respect to the development. Furthermore, um, I would draw your attention to the paragraphs relating to landfill gas migration, where um, I understand Fitchner Consultant Engineers have um, made reference to that in the application to the Environment Agency that says that, yes, they acknowledge that there is landfill gas migration, but it is low risk. Moving on to highway matters, members will be aware that um, traffic uh, is already associated with the Allerton Park site. Members will recall seeing the RCVs, the refuse collection vehicles, entering the site on the day of the site visit, uh, as they do to enter the existing landfill site. The application has been accompanied by a... Um, by a consultant's report, and in objection to the development, the uh, parish council's group had submitted a, a, a consultant's report that they had commissioned by URS. 
That is explained within the paragraphs on pages 222 to 227. Members, um, I don't propose to go into detail as there's quite extensive discussion about the two reports. Suffice to say that the Highway Authority has had sight of the reports and has returned comment in respect. The Highways Agency and the Highways Authority have returned no objection in respect to this application. However, I, I should point out that members, uh, to members that conditions have been suggested um, and considered appropriate to make the development acceptable and a legal agreement is proposed in respect of matters raised in paragraph 7.327 which refer to four items in respect to the legal agreement. That is the provision of a travel plan, a heavy goods vehicle management plan, construction phase traffic management plan and the contribution of um, £128,791 for future maintenance costs with regards to the um, A168 and A59 junction. With respect to public rights of way, also connected to highways issues, members will recall my mentioning that there, are, there is a public right of way that is directly, could be directly affected by the development should the uh, operator for the national grid choose route A, the northern route, um, as part of the development to connect this particular development to the Coneythorpe substation. However, there are conditions that are proposed and would be imposed in terms of the reinstatement of that right of way if the cable route was to choose, if, if were to, to use route A, the northern route, as opposed to route B. It, it, are we discussing the routes then or is it left up to the energy company to decide which one because plan B would be on the highway so that the right to wear and wear leaves would be there because they can go straight into the road. So, but then we're not discussing that, yeah? Are we not? We're not? Okay. It's up to the utility, it is. The it utility is company to yeah. decide which is the most suitable route. Members, the next environmental effect under consideration within Section 7 of the report is that which concerns ecology and biodiversity issues. Members will re recall, um, sorry, this is page two, two, 231, starting with paragraph uh, 7.350. In respect of ecology and biodiversity issues, the uh, applicant has undertaken uh, the relevant surveys to uh, assess the site in uh, respect of its uh, habitat, not only existing habitat, but also habitat potential for protected species. Protected species are identified in paragraph 7.352 of the report, including breeding birds, reptiles, bats, water voles and amphibians, and badgers. Bats have been identified to, um, to exist and forage in the area uh, surrounding Claro House. And members will recall being, uh, that being pointed out actually on the site visit last week. Measures have been incorporated into the development proposals to specifically uh, ensure the habitat of the, the uh, bats is protected and to provide um, enhancement opportunities for habitats for protected species in the local area as part of its proposals. No objection has been returned in respect of the proposal from the County Council's expert advisor um, uh, on such matters, the principal ecologist, nor have any objections been returned by Natural England, the statutory consultee on such matters. Page 237 members point to hydrology, hydrogeology and flood risk. Paragraph, uh, it starts at paragraph 7.380. Um, 
Members will recall my mention in the presentation and also on site the existence of the surf surface water attenuation pond, which be, would be a means of dealing with um, fluctuations in surface water runoff from the site um, and uh, the sustainable urban drainage system principles have also been incorporated into the development, as would the seeding roof would be, help with roof water as well. The site is within, is not, I'll say again, the site is not within a flood risk area. Page 238 members refers to geology, contaminated land and stability. Can you just ask where the water's coming for the cooling for the uh, generator plant? That's not from this source, is it? Councillor Pert, this is to deal with surface water runoff, the right. attenuation. So, so where's the water coming for the generator, for the, for the steam? Would, um, I understand it's a closed system. It's a, it's a, yeah. Yes. Right. Is it? <laughs> Members, um, geology, contaminated land and, land and stability. These are identified as uh, matters that should be addressed in any uh, environmental statement and have been assessed as being, as being what's termed scoped in and not scoped out, i.e. it has been assessed as part of the um, environmental impact assessment process. Um, there have been no impacts identified nor objections returned by the Environment Agency, which is the expert advisor to the County Planning Authority on such matters. Pages 239 and 241 of the uh, report um, 239. refer to the uh, other issues um, these are a collection of issues that have been raised uh, in objection to the development and therefore addressed in the main considerations of this report. In terms of socio-economic impact, you'll have heard speeches today referring to job creation. Uh, for, for members' um, information, job creation um, is is thought to be in the region of approximately 400 uh, jobs during the construction phase of the development. At the time of operation, um, it's estimated that there would be 70 full-time jobs. However, it is acknowledged that this may um, involve displacement of some jobs from the existing quarry and from the landfill site. However, members will be reminded of the fact that the landfill site um, does have um, a significant amount of void space left and may well continue to operate beyond its current permitted uh, time period of 2018. Uh, tourism has also been identified as a, uh, in part of the objections to the development. However, in respect to tourism, it's not considered that any e evidence exists of a significant impact on tourism. In respect to devaluation of properties, you will have heard my um, member of staff, Alan, earlier in respect of another item on the agenda, um, in respect of devaluation of properties, this is not a material planning considerations for members to, to give any weight to. On, um, with respect to on-site waste minimisation, the applicant has to provide a site waste management plan which would e explain how waste is dealt with on the site. With respect to agricultural land, of course the agricultural restoration um, of the previous uh, site prior to mineral extraction and landfill was expected to be restored to agricultural restoration. You'll, see, you'll have seen the restoration plan on the, uh, app, on the presentation earlier and also the uh, restoration plan in your plan pack uh, which will refer to the restoration 
and there is no reason to consider that that level of restoration could not pertain on the um, cessation of this development and decommission of this development at that time. Bear with me, members. having a drink. Any question that's uh, bubbling up? Count yeah, Councillor Council Bled. Just on the waste management uh, plan, I've read earlier in the report that in a breakdown they have six days or something storage. Does that come into it because um, there was a fire at Thirst with internal combustion with waste, with waste? That is a risk. Is that taken into account by the environment and agency then? Uh, Councillor Blades, the site waste management plan, as I understand them, and they're not something that we deal with under our jurisdiction as the County Planning Authority, the site waste management plan um, deals with the, the construction element, how they're yeah. going to deal with the waste on the site, yeah. what excavation would be made, and how they would deal with waste materials. What you're talking about is uh, time periods of um, unexpected Breakout. breakdowns. Um, uh, it's my understanding that the bunkers um, would uh, provide six days of um, ongoing, uh, sorry, six days of storage of waste import into the site. I do understand that if one of the lines, because there is, and forgive me, I didn't explain this, but in the internals in the development, there's two lines that would be fed into the uh, combustion chamber. And if one line failed, there would be 14 days of operation to keep, to keep going. So that would provide 14 days. Does that help, Councillor? I'm, af I'm afraid mm -hmm. if, I, if I can't ask... It, the... No, it's just that organic waste does heat up quickly. Yeah. It does. And I think that was one of the reasons why it burnt down at thirst because of organic matter heating up and it fired up. That's all I think. If they, if they, if you, I mean, the Environment Agency will make the decision, not us. Presumably. And it's in the interest of the operators to manage this site properly. I'm sure they will. Blades, that the, the build-up of, um, of biodegradable waste within a development is, is a licensing issue. A license. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Councillor Nag, to view a Two points, please, Chairman. Uh, first one, uh, 400 people have been employed on construction. They won't all be professionals. I'd like to think that a lot of those people will be locally employed people when in the construction. On the second point, uh, the land, uh, Grade A 3, to be restored afterwards, I presume at this time we haven't any idea what type of, uh, how much acreage at that time will be restored. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's a, a long question yeah, this time, and if you don't know, I quite accept that. Thank you. Thank you. Members, the next section um, to deal with um, in the report on section seven refers to uh, cumulative impact which is found on page 241 and paragraph 7.402 of your report. One of the largest sections within that particular bit of the, uh, of the main considerations is given over to the existence of other developments. And if members are happy, I, w I won't go in verbatim uh, into the report, however, the applicant has assessed the cumulative effects and cumulative effects are a requirement of the environmental impact assessment procedures. Um, and they have assessed the development as, uh, in the light of uh, two other developments in the area. The first being the uh, leachate management facility uh, proposal on the landfill site, which of course does not involve any built development it is just a major development um, adjacent to this particular development. Um, the short rotation coppice would be um, uh, part of the leachate management system if that were to be implemented. Permission exists for that development. Um, however, I, I understand at this point in time it hasn't been implemented. The other development is also uh, referred to within the report 
as the uh, golf club development on the Flaxby Golf Course. And members will recall showing the location of the Flaxby Golf Course towards the southwest of the uh, development. The report goes into detail about the location of the, um, the golf club and that development and how that has been assessed as well. The, the permission, to permission in principle has been decided by the Borough Council Planning Committee. However, a plan and permission hasn't been issued as there is a, 106, a section 106 agreement, legal agreement, um, which is still remains outstanding on that site. Um, there is not considered to be um, a cumulative impact, um, uh, adverse cumulative impact on the grounds of the existence of other developments uh, in the local area. Uh, part B of the, um, of the cumulative impacts that have been assessed also looks at the use of natural resources, the emissions and creation of nuisances, elimina elimination of waste and also combination effects. The conclusion being in no circumstances in those particular elements, parts of that uh, section of the report, are there any um, reasons to, uh, to give rise to a, a reason for refusal on those grounds alone? Pause for question. Councillor Goss. Yeah. With regard to emissions, um, <clears throat> this is from, um, from traffic that's generated uh, to and fro from the site. Um, surely the, you have to take into account that the emissions from various parts of the county will have to be considered because this will increase our carbon footprint uh, dramatically, especially in the Harrogate area. Is that not so? Councillor, you jumped ahead of me again. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the emissions of uh, traffic um, have been uh, part of the calculation and the analysis of what's known as rate, and that forms one of the sections that I'm going to be coming on to. So, yes, the uh, emissions from traffic has taken into account. Members, pages 246 and 249, um, sorry, 246, 249, um, refer to uh, issues relating to climate change. The first of those issues <coughs> concerns energy recovery. The proposal in front of you today concerns the recovery of energy amounting to some 24 megawatts in total of electricity produced by this development. You'll have heard mention made this morning with regards to renewable energy. With respect to the uh, biodegradable element, um, the, that is termed renewable energy, and one megawatt of electricity would be produced by the anaerobic digester facility, and the energy from waste facility would, have, would produce 15.5 megawatts of renewable energy. This is supported in policy at both the national, local and the European level. You will have also, <coughs> excuse me, you will have also heard reference to combined heat and power. Within the report, reference is made to combined heat and power as being a possibility. However, if combined heat and power were to be a, um, a part of the development um, and it is, it is designed to be retrofitted for combined heat and power, members have to bear in mind that there will be a knock-on effect to the amount of electricity produced. So this development without combined heat and power would produce 24 megawatts of electricity. 
For uh, comparison's sake, this co is comparable with the NABS uh, Ridge development at Harrogate on the wind farm, producing a similar amount of uh, energy. Moving on to um, the uh, tool councillor Goss that I was referring to about calculations on emissions um, is the rate analysis, which is uh, provided on pages 250 to 256 of the report. Mm -hmm. There is a significant amount of text within the report that re relates to the issue of, way, of rate, which is the Waste and Resources Assessment Tool for the Environment. Councillor Holt, you've been very quiet, so I'll let you have a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, was just, I didn't know whether we'd concluded on the 249, on the conclusions of the energy-related issues, or whether you've got anything more to say, Vicky? Uh -huh. Oh, do you want me to wait until you, you may answer my question? I just, thought, I just wanted to point um, members to paragraphs to, uh, 7. Point Thank you, Rachel. 7.446 and 7.447, which refers to the um, calculated carbon dioxide uh, equivalent em um, tonnes, a saving of 130,200 tonnes. Um, and that is made up by um, avoiding fossil fuel use in electricity production in power stations, um, and that is uh, calculated as 60,100 tonnes, and 70,000 uh, 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents in greenhouse gas emission uh, prevention. And by that, I mean uh, greenhouse gases that are produced in landfill sites uh, going to atmosphere. Now, Councillor um, Holt, you were going to refer to paragraph 449. No? no? Oh. Do, a, do apologise. Oh, do apologise. Yeah, OK. I mean, on that, I was thinking about this condition that's been put on, which is uh, condition 42, I think it is, and, and this uh, aspiration to assess uh, the usage of the heat generated and um, ask why could not this not have been done before this application came before us. I mean, it seems to me almost a, almost a technical uh, calculation to say, well, if, as you say, 24 megawatts um, without uh, CHP, I don't know what it is with CHP, but there's a figure. Why can't, it, why can't we sort of say, yes, we can use this heat, or no, we can't, rather than asking the uh, applicant to do a calculation after he's got approval. Not a calculation, do an assessment, which he might come back and say, we oh, can't do anything, tough. I mean, I'd like an answer to that, and then I'd like to go on to the, a question about the Fitch and the calculation. Councillor Holt, um, I trust you were referring to the condition that is in the, the late representations. Yes, yeah. Um, that obliges the applicant to um, assess the opportunities for heat offtake from the development. Um, the development, as I understand it, has, um, endeavor, it has been accompanied by a heat assessment which has looked at the amount of development within the five kilometres, which the Environment Agency says is deemed as being economically viable. However, with these particular developments, you've got to obviously negotiate, and there are private contractual issues that are involved in that. And I understand those, those contractual discussions have been or are due to take place, but that's not part of the proposal in front of us. But I do feel it's important to ensure that that is not lost in terms of a condition imposed on the, the consent. 
that was on. The, you mentioned, Vicky, that you don't. Yes, on. You you said that we do a calculation on um, your calculation on the actual CO2 savings or, or whatever was based on comparing it with landfill and um, and the incineration or, or sorry the the recovery. Now, did the assessment of the landfill take into account the possibility of of harvesting methane from landfill, uh, which would actually reduce the the amount of um, uh, green, green climate warming gases into the atmosphere, and in that regard, is this 40,000 tonnes, which it, which it is now, I think, of CO2 saved, does that include methane, or is it purely CO2? Because it's talk about methane being 25 times more dangerous. How does all this work? Because I've got real concerns about this. The, one of the, the things that I, I should point out and is in the report um, about the rate analysis tool is, is not really um, purpose-built for specific planning applications. Its, it's audience is the, the uh, decision makers on waste management strategies and therefore has to apply global figures. Um, and I'm also aware that um, certain landfill sites do not lend themselves to um, extraction of methane gas purely because of their construction over the years. They may not actually be able to harness the gas. So it isn't, it isn't a straightforward calculation saying no methane or methane. So I, I, wouldn't, I don't think it's appropriate for me to, to comment definitively on whether that's part of the actual analysis. Um, Councillor Gold, I, I wouldn't say it's useless. I would say that on the analysis of which there have been um, three reports undertaken, there's, there's the report for um, the applicant themselves, Fitchner Consulting, who you have heard from the gentleman this, morn, uh, this afternoon, or this morning. Um, uh, the Waste Disposal Authority has uh, commissioned SKM and Viros to also uh, do the, the, a similar analysis, um, and Unomia, um, on behalf of the Parish Council's group, commissioned on their behalf to also undertake an analysis. Um, I, I, I believe that the conclusions throughout them are saying that the, there will be a net climate change benefit resulting from the developments. However, if you bear with me, please, um, there is mention within the uh, Unomia report of landfill possibly being just as um, uh, beneficial, um, probably the wrong word, but just, just at the same level of what the uh, Allerton Waste Recycling Park uh, would be. However, it's perverse to consider landfill as being a continuation in perpetuity when you consider that European, national and local policies all seek to secure diversion away, away from landfill. Which leads nicely on to diversion from landfill, which is the next section. <laughs> Chair. Uh, um, Chair. Yeah, probably for best to do so, yeah. Chair, I wonder if we could have just a, a break, short break, and just sort of five minute break. <laughs> That we will have a, a ten minute a ten minute break, please. It's, we'll be here at a quarter past four. Who was reading the
the book on us being finished by God. Ha ha. I said we'd take the board.
Right, we will, we will recommence if everyone can take the seats, please. I think Vicky has one or two uh, amendments to make. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, there's um, a point of correction. I do apologise to members. Um, when I referred to the um, Alison Park site and its comparison uh, with the climate change benefits to landfill, I was incorrect in saying that it was just as beneficial. Um, in fact, actually on paragraph 7.463, of uh, page 254 of the re substantive report, the um, one, two, three, four, five. The fifth bullet point of that paragraph refers to the uh, AWRP performing worse than landfill. This, of course, is the um, uh, Unomia report, and in their opinion, the um, the AWRP performs worse than landfill. So many apologies, members. It was incorrect, and um, I made that correction for you. Um, my second point um, refers to the matter with regards to the question about uh, comparisons and the assumptions made in the rate analysis uh, and whether landfill gas um, electricity production is part of that calculation. Um, members, if I can ask for you, your patience to refer to Ian Fielding, uh, Assistant Director with responsibility for waste management, to give you um, a, the technical answer on that for you. Thank you, Mr. John. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll start off by saying I am not an expert in, in rate. Rate is a very complicated uh, tool developed by the Environment Agency to energy development. Um, like uh, anyone, any authority wanting to run rate, we've employed our own consultants and advisors to help us in the way we've used it. But I do know a little bit about it, and I know enough um, about it to, to be able to report, yes, it is, uh, Councillor Holt's question particularly, yes, it does take into account um, the, uh, the, the benefits, if you like, in inverted commas, of landfill in terms of generating landfill gas, which can then be used to, to generate electricity. Uh, it, it, rate works by allowing a number of values to be input um, to make it as specific as you, as you can to drill down the specifics for your, your own strategy decisions. But there are a suite of default values in there. Um, we, uh, we, as the Waste Disposal Authority, reviewed Amy Sesper's rate model as part of the procurement, uh, and we were comfortable with the assumptions they made in, the, in their models being reflective of the general position uh, relevant to North Yorkshire and to allow us to compare with other other bids. Uh, and from memory, I believe they were using what you might call the default values for recovery of gas from uh, landfill. One of the difficulties we've got in making comparisons, and the last point Vicky pointed out about the Unomia report is a good example. Um, Unomia have concluded that, that um, AWRP would be worse than landfill. We don't know the assumptions that they've made to reach that conclusion, so I can't comment as to how they've got to that conclusion and what assumptions they made, for instance, around the benefits of, of using landfill gas to generate electricity. I know from what we've said and what we've reviewed and as Amy says that we're broadly comfortable with it, but I can't make that direct comparison with anyone else's uh, running of the model. So, but it, the answer to your question, I think, is yes, it does include it and it will have included it for both parties in this case. That really. Um, I mean, what bothers me is we have... Uh, Fitchner, we have then Unomia, and we have two different calculations. So we bring in that. And in the report, it says, SK and Virus point out, neither Fitchner nor Unomia provided detailed assumptions used. Now, so, I mean, we're left in the dark as to know whether Fitchner or Unomia use the right assumptions, or can they just pick and choose the assumptions? And if they do, it comes back to my point, what is the use of this to us? I mean, it would have been better if SKM and Viros had been able to say, Fitchner have used the right assumptions, you know me, I hasn't, or vice <coughs> versa. But we're left in the dark. It seems as though you pick your own assumptions and what you turn out, then you just say, oh, which one shall we believe? You know, that's, I think, the position members are in. Well, I, you know, I, I totally agree. Two, two consultants could come up with different answers using the same tool. It's uh, difficult for members to get their head around.
Could I just add a point? Um, the, the reference in the report to SKM not having the two models refers to the two models that have been run recently and that have informed the specific development. What I can say is SKM uh, did have, uh, did have um, access to the models run by FICNA in support of the procurement, albeit two years ago, but the outputs from that model and the recent FICNA model are broadly comparable. So we have conf we, we've concluded from that that they're using this probably the same assumptions or very similar assumptions. Uh, and we are then broadly comfortable with those assumptions. The other thing to point out is in, during the procurement uh, uh, and, and the, the review of our models we did then, we also asked for all bidders using rate at that time to have their models independently verified. So not only do we have comfort that SKM have reviewed uh, the, the FICNA model or something similar to it, the, the model that's presented now, we also have knowledge that they were independently verified at that time as well. So we have from the Waste Disposal Authority perhaps um, comfort in the FICNA model being an accurate representation as, as it can be at this stage of what's proposed. Uh, members, if, if I may come in on that, what Ian has just said, um, could I point members to paragraph 7.473, please, on page 256? Um, that uh, paragraph uh, states that it appears to officers that a carbon saving in 2030 over landfill is the likely result of the AWRP proposal Although, as SKM and Viros point out, neither Fitchner nor, nor Eunomia have provided the detailed assumptions used. However, SKM and Viros have said that, the ba that based on the information and results provided in the Fitchner model, they can support Fitchner's conclusion that the proposed development would provide an improvement on landfill up to and beyond 2030, and officers are content to advise members accordingly. Members, diversion from landfill, page 256, so it's the under, a couple of paragraphs below that. Diversion of waste from landfill is a fundamental objective of European and national policy and legislation, regional planning policy and the local waste joint uh, municipal waste management strategy for, Yorkshire, for York and North Yorkshire. The diversion from um, landfill of biodegradable waste um, and its contribution to uh, greenhouse gas emission avoidance is a principle that is set out and, and the basis of the policy and legislative um, context, which is explained earlier in the report. With respect to existing and forecasted landfill capacity, Explanation is provided in paragraphs uh, 7.486 to 7.490 on pages 258 and 259, where, where the context there is that proposals um, for landfill in the future are likely to be subject to considerable um, policy objection in the light of national, regional and local policy. So existing controls, um, sorry, existing contracts by the Waste Disposal Authority have explained that it indicates a continuing decline in capacity of landfill sites. This would continue to be the case where applications could, to come forward for landfill to be considered in the context of being contrary to policy. With respect to impact on recycling and waste production, Explanations provided on page 259, 260 and 261. It's not anticipated that there would be a conflict with recycling, uh, with the higher levels of recycling. Um, it's acknowledged within the report that, the, that high levels of recycling can exist and are capable of working hand in hand with one another. Moving on to the... Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Vicky, could, could I just ask regarding capacity? Um, 
the, the applicant seemed to think there will be enough waste um, uh, to treat at the um, Allerton Park plant and the uh, objectors take the opposing view. Um, and there's some mention about taking up any shortfall with um, commercial and industrial waste. Uh, could you tell me what type of materials come under the heading of commercial and industrial waste? And have you, has that been taken into account, i.e. in terms of the, the impact that treating those kind of things will have at the park? Uh, Councillor Lee, thank you for, for that question. The, um, the context of the types of materials um, that would be the commercial and industrial waste uh, would be similar in nature to that which household waste also can, uh, includes. Um, so they are of a, a similar type as you would get in your black bag win, bin waste from commercial and retail properties. Uh, and indeed the report outlines the fact that the authority would have a duty to dispose of that waste um, uh, within the facility. The likelihood, you mentioned about the likelihood of capacity and um, the volumes. Yes, I was just, if you could just comment, on, I, I think... Uh, it was mainly the, um, I just wanted clarification on the type of, um, you know, what, what came under the heading of commercial yeah. and industrial. Councillor yeah. Nagsy wanted to come in. Thank you, Chairman. Could I ask Mr Fielding a question? Yeah. Can I ask Mr Fielding a question? Well, I think Mr Fielding will know the answer, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Through the Chairman. Through the Chairman. Could you uh, inform this committee where this county stands at this particular time with landfill sites available? Maybe a two-part answer between me and Vicky. I, I can comment on the um, landfill sites that the county council uses under contract. We've currently got um, contracts for uh, landfill disposal at Allerton Park. Uh, in fact, that is our, our, our biggest site in terms of the amount of going to landfill. Uh, Harewood Wynn in York, and at the moment, Napton Quarry uh, in Rydale. Uh, Napton Quarry, we expect, um, in fact, all, all three sites are currently under contract until 2015. We expect Napton Quarry to close when, the, when that contract um, ends in 2015. Well, is there, can I ask a, a substitute of that? Is there any more available sites? Because this reflects on this, what we're doing here today. Is landfill sites available? All right, Vicky. Uh, Councillor Nags, um, I think if, if members of the committee, um, it's uh, a long time since we've dealt with a, a landfill site. We've dealt with a lot of waste management processing facilities, but it's a substantial amount of time of dealing with a, a new landfill site. We've had extension and time uh, on a number of landfills uh, because of the um, uh, they've got their existing sites and they're either raising the levels or extending the period of time but uh, very very rare do we have, uh, have an application for a, a new landfill site. So at this particular time there isn't any on board? No. Thank you. Point of order, what, what is that relevance to a plan, this planning application? <laughs> Chairman, if I could answer that question, um, the point, if you like, being put was about what other sort of capacity there is, and obviously one of the issues that members will be taking into account as a material consideration is need. Another issue, if you like, as a material consideration is uh, possible alternatives, and those are covered within the report. So I saw it as a question tending to those particular points. <laughs> which moves on to the argument of need, which is on page 262. Um, page 262 uh, to, pages, uh, to page 272, uh, the need for the development. Within that section of uh, the main considerations of the report, um, it's recognised that a need um, 
is encompassed within national and European policy and legislation. The, con the continuing driving force is that of the pushing waste management up the hierarchy and away from landfill. Notwithstanding the substantial number of objections returned to the contrary, the County Planning Authority has had regard to the assessment of need put forward by the applicant. <coughs> Moving on to section um, regarding consideration of alternative mm -hmm. technologies on page 273 of the report. <laughs> Councillor Pitt. Yeah, with, with the abolition of the LATs, has that made any difference to this application then, as to the need? It doesn't, it doesn't have a, a, a bearing. It just obviously um, has a, a bearing in terms of the wider, the county council, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of that particular, Cost. the finance consideration, but not in terms of the planning application. But not in the... So. Yeah, thank you. Members, if I move on to um, consideration of alternative technologies. Whilst the authority is aware that and recognises the existence of other technologies that may be available, it's considered it would be unreasonable to be pres prescriptive about the technology proposed to be employed in this particular instance. There are no alternative technology options put forward by the applicant within this application other than that which is proposed. Consideration of a single versus multi-site solution. Whilst the applicant has referred to the proposal in front of members before this today as a single site solution, um, there are in fact, one considers a bigger picture uh, being recognised and that is that the proposed development would be the central hub along the spokes of which would be other waste management facilities across the county. Uh, Mr Adams earlier referred to the site selection assessment and that is referred to in, uh, on pages 276 and 280 of the substantive report. With regards to the site selection exercise undertaken, it was explained how that had um, come to fruition. It's recognised that the applicant has undertaken a site search assessment and has followed the principles and criteria set down in both national and local policy. A sequential approach has been undertaken and, con and um, had uh, due regard to the criteria contained in Annex E of um, PPS 10 and concluded with the chosen site at Allerton Quarry and Landfill. The County Planning Authority is satisfied with this approach. Financial considerations are considered on page 280 of the report, paragraphs um, 7.573 to 7.575. Whilst acknowledging the existence of PFI involvement in respect to this proposal, it isn't a matter to give uh, any weight in, sorry, it, it is not a matter to which any weight is given in assessing the proposed development. Moving on to the presumption in favour of sustainable development, which is explained within paragraph 7.576 7 to 7.578 on page 281 of the substantive report. The recent publication of the National Planning Policy Framework in March of this year, whilst not diminishing the status of the development plan, provides the up-to-date position with regards to national planning policy and gives di direction on matters relating to sustainable development.
Would you like me to pause for your mm. conclusions? Yeah. Anybody?